So how's everybody doing today? Good. good. It's good to be back here um, talking about a, a topic that is strangely uh, contemporary, I guess, with, with today. Um, this coming Sunday is November 11th. Oh, wow. November 11th, we celebrate as what? Veterans Day now. Veterans Day now. Day now. Originally, however, November 11th was celebrated as Armistice Day. Yeah. The date on which the fighting in the First World War came to an end. Because of that, because we're approaching the centennial of the end of the First World War, um, it was 100 years ago, in November of 1918, that that struggle came to an end. Today's talk will look at kind of the, the end of the First World War and the aftermath of the First World War and how it um, tragically led to another mm -hmm. global struggle. Uh, about 30 years later. So, today's talk is called November 1918, War, Peace, and the Fate of the World. Just because I like to make it dramatic. <laughs> so, um, where do we start off? Well, from 1914 to November of 1918, the world, Europe, the United States, uh, and their global empires were engaged in a titanic struggle on uh, across Europe, in Africa, in the colonies, the, the global empires. It was today called the First World War. At that time, it was referred to as the Great War. It was a war of unimaginable magnitude. The number of deaths, the amount of destruction, just the sheer size of the battles and, and the, the lives lost was something that had been unimaginable in the summer of 1914, when the war begins. When the French marched off to war in August of 1914, and when the Germans marched off to war in the summer of 1914, everybody figured the war would be over by Christmas. The French had plans of celebrating Christmas in Berlin, and the Germans had plans of celebrating Christmas in Paris. Nobody imagined that the war would drag on for four years, and that it would be so costly and so destructive. Uh, some of the images you see here, this is the uh, Belgian town of Ypres in kind of northwestern Europe. There were three major battles fought around that town. Uh, the British and the Germans and the French all involved in kind of trading territory back and forth around there. Um, the building that you see destroyed here was the 13th century cloth guild hall. It had survived for 800 plus years, only to be destroyed during the fighting in the First World War. Um, that building has since been rebuilt, so if you go there today, you see a 20th century replica of the original Guildhall building. The image on the right is the Battle of the Somme, which was fought in 1916, one of two titanic battles fought during that year um, in, western, in eastern France. You had the Battle of Verdun, which pitted the German army assaulting fortified French positions, and the Battle of the Somme, which was the British launching an assault on fortified German positions. The Battle of the Somme would last from June to November of 1916, and it would be one of the costliest battles in British military history. In fact, on the first day of the battle, more than 20,000 British soldiers are killed on a single day, wow. the single bloodiest day in British military history. So the First World War that all the military planners, all the politicians thought was going to be a relatively quick and painless struggle, dragged out to being this titanic, massive, event that essentially destroyed the, the vigor of all of the European nations. Now by the summer of 1918, by early 1918, the spring and summer of 1918, the tide of war had begun to shift. The tide of battle had turned against Germany. And one of the important factors of why that happened was because in 1917, the United States gets involved. We had been a neutral power for the first two and a half years of the war. But in uh, <clears throat> April of 1917, the United States declares war on Germany. We join Britain and France and Italy fighting against the central powers. And it isn't really until early 1918 that American military might begins to show up on the continent. And it tips the, ba tips the balance in favor of the Allies. Germany has been fighting and sacrificing for more than four years. They've been fighting a two-front war fighting against the Russians in the East and the French and the British in the West. And by the summer of 1918, German military power was basically um, strong enough for one last gamble. 
And in the spring and summer of 1918, the Germans la launch a major offensive toward the French and the British lines, moving westward. That offensive is stopped, partly because of the presence of American forces. New, fresh American reinforcements, stop, helping to stop this German advance. So that by the fall of 1918, Germany was rapidly losing its ability to maintain the fight. And in November of 1918, the German high command made overtures toward the Allies to find a way to stop the fighting. That armistice, that agreement to stop the fighting, was um, signed in a train car outside of Paris. You see the image over there. The Allied delegation went, uh, met the German delegation, and they picked a date and a time to stop the war. It was decided that the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month would be the moment when the fighting would stop. So we had an end point. But up until that moment, the war continued. In fact, there are some uh, crazy, tragic stories about the last day of the fighting of the First World War, November 11th, and how uh, commanders, Allied commanders, German commanders, wanted to make that last heroic, get, gain that last heroic victory. And actually at like 10.30 in the morning, half hour before the war was, the fighting was supposed to stop, they were launching assaults on entrenched positions and their men were being massacred right as the war was about to end. The last casualty of the First World War actually occurs at like 10.59 wow. on November 11th, 1918. So they were fighting right until the end. The commanders, the generals, wanted that last bit of military glory and sacrificed their soldiers in achieving it. In any case, when 11 a.m. comes about on November 11th, the fighting stops. The front, the Western Front, falls silent. It was almost an, an eerie silence because there was essentially nothing alive there anymore. All the trees had been destroyed. All the animals that had been there had been killed. The guns just stop, and there was kind of this uneasy silence. Um, on one side of no man's land, in the British trenches, a couple of heads pop up and look across the German trenches and a couple of heads pop up. And slowly the soldiers begin pulling out of their trenches and kind of meeting in the middle um, and begin realizing that the fighting has actually come to an end. The four years of destruction and bloodshed and, and horror of the First World War just suddenly stops. And it must have been almost a surreal moment for the soldiers. Back at home, in London, in Paris, in New York, in Berlin, however, the news that the war had come to an end was met with incredible jubilation. There were parties in the streets. Uh, people thronged out to the streets of Paris and London. Uh, here you see them celebrating on double-decker buses riding through the streets of London. The crowd gathered on Wall Street here in New York City. American soldiers celebrating in France. French newspapers celebrating the fact that the war had come to an end. The jubilation, the euphoria of the end of the war among the civilian populations was, was almost incredible. There are accounts from London that um, people were just embracing each other. Total strangers were so relieved that the war had ended that there were scenes of... Uh, public fornication in doorways as people were celebrating life and the fact that the war had ended. Um, so you have this incredible sense of relief, this incredible sense of celebration that the war has finally come to an end. Because the war was so scary, so destructive, so overwhelming, um, it's really hard to kind of put into to words how destructive the First World War is or was. But numbers, statistics, kind of give us a, a glimpse of the damage there. Over the four years of the war, there were some 65 million combatants, 65 million people who were in uniform, participated in the war. Of those, nearly 30 million were killed or wounded. And another uh, 7 to 8 million were taken as prisoner or were missing in action. Um, so you had a total casualty rate of about 37 and a half million people. Wow. Uh, that is a casualty rate above 50%. Mm. One, in two, one out of two combatants was either killed, wounded, prisoner, or missing. 
uh, the numbers are really, really staggering. But even those numbers don't give you the, the sense of the destruction. Uh, this image over here kind of helps illustrate those numbers. That is the French military cemetery, at one of the French military cemeteries at the battlefield of Verdun, again, in eastern France. Um, you just see the rows of crosses kind of fading off into infinity. And the building over here in the background was an ossuary, a monument and a storehouse for bones that were recovered from the battlefield. Soldiers whose remains could not be identified were gathered up and stored in that building. Um, even today, in eastern France, you occasionally see news reports of a farmer digging his field, uh, plowing his field and coming across the remains of soldiers from the First World War. And occasionally you hear stories of farmers plowing their fields and hitting some unexploded ammunition from the Second World War and being, uh, from the First World War and being killed by this, uh, these armaments that are over a hundred years old now. So the legacy of the First World War, even today, the physical remnants of it are still very much present in uh, Eastern France, Western Germany. The trench lines are still there. There are areas around Verdun where vegetation is starting to come back, but the ground is cratered because of the, the amount of artillery and the number of bombs that were dropped in the vicinity of those battlefields. So the war itself was tremendously, tremendously destructive. People in Europe, across the world, thought humanity can't possibly do this again. The, this great war has, must have taught us a lesson. This must be the war to end all wars. How could we possibly allow this scale of destruction to, to ever occur again? The British, the French, the Germans, the Russians sacrificed an entire generation of men on the battlefields. It was unfathomable, unimaginable, completely disruptive of society. So when the war does come to an end, when the fighting comes to an end, it's decided that we need a treaty that will prevent war from happening again. So in December of 1918, diplomats and uh, state leaders begin to arrive in Paris to attend what will become a peace conference, the Paris Peace Conference. Um, now, throughout history, diplomats and heads of state and people who are signing treaties often go to Paris to sign those treaties or to negotiate those treaties. Why do people go to Paris when they have to do diplomacy? Why do you go to Paris if you're not doing diplomacy? <laughs> good art, good food, plentiful wine, pretty girls, you leave your wife at home, you go to Paris and you have a good time. Uh, you're conducting diplomacy, but you're also enjoying the fruits of the city. In any case, um, the United States, whose role in the war does kind of lead to Allied victory, or help lead to Allied victory, becomes one of the central players in the crafting of the peace accord. And uh, in order to create this treaty, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, goes to Paris. He packs up, leaves Washington, D.C., and will head to Paris in December of 1918. When he arrives in Paris, he is treated like a conquering hero. Throngs of people line the streets to watch him pass by. Here you see the banner, Vive Wilson. There you see the crowds in Paris as Wilson's carriage makes its way through the streets. It's estimated that some three million people were in Paris to watch Woodrow Wilson wind his way through the city. The population of Paris at that time was about a million and a million and a half to a million and a half. So there were people coming from outside of the city, flocking in to see the American president. So he arrives as kind of this key figure in the, the planning of the peace conference in Paris, the, the making of the peace accord. And it's really in January of 1919 that the conference itself, itself comes to order and begins, to, begins the process of creating a treaty. Um, though most of the combatant nations had representatives at Paris, at the Paris Peace Conference, um, to help craft the treaty. The treaty that emerges from this conference was basically the handiwork of four men. These four over here, they were known as the Big Four, was David Lloyd George, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, Vittorio Orlando, the Premier of Italy, Georges Clemenceau, with his walrus mustache over here, was the Premier of France, and Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. These were the four that essentially dictated how the 
the peace conference would go that pushed the negotiations and the settlements as they were created. Now, the Paris Peace Conference is, was a very um, complex meeting. Lots of people had different things they wanted to get out of the Paris Peace Conference. You had Italy, who wanted to acquire territory at the expense of Austria. You had Japan, who, was, who fought with the Allies in Asia, who wanted to acquire territory at the expense of Germany. You had um, you know, Britain and France, who had felt that Germany was responsible for the war. They wanted to punish Germany. And then you had Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, who comes into the Paris Peace Conference hoping to create a just peace a peace among equals. He wanted to see um, kind of a peaceful post-war world. But as the conference gets underway, as the negotiations begin to unfold, as Wilson is spending time with the other uh, treaty makers here, he begins to abandon many of his idealistic points of view. He begins to uh, be convinced by the British and the French that Germany is to blame for the war and that Germany should be held responsible and that Germany should be prevented from waging war. So the Paris Peace Conference that had the opportunity to perhaps craft a document that would ensure long-term peace in Europe starts to devolve into a conference that will punish Germany. The end result of the Paris Peace Conference, the Versailles Treaty, was a treaty not so much to end war, but to blame Germany for the war. Um, the Versailles Treaty is a long, elaborate uh, document, but throughout the entire document, the universal theme is that Germany is responsible for the war, and Germany is responsible for the damage wrought by the war. Uh, what you see here are two scenes from the signing of the treaty. This was the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles, Louis XIV's famous palace on the outskirts of Paris. This is where the treaty signing took place. Now, when the Versailles Treaty was created, it wasn't so much a treaty of negotiation as a treaty that was imposed on the Germans. The German delegation in Paris wasn't really invited to the party. They weren't allowed to negotiate. In fact, it was created by the Allies, each with their list of demands. And when the document was finished, it was presented to the German delegation. And they were given the ultimatum, ultimatum of signing it or going back to war. The Germans, of course, were shocked by this. They were insulted by this. And the first group of German diplomats actually resigned, or threatened to resign in disgust. They called back to Germany, saying, can we continue the war? They talked to the War Department. They talked to the, the generals and the general staff. And the staff says, we can't. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the equipment. Our armies are exhausted. We cannot fight the war. So the German delegation uh, writes a list of objections to the treaty, which they submit to the, the, tr the treaty makers. Uh, most of those are largely ignored. And Germany is essentially forced to sign this document. They are threatened with continued warfare, warfare that they can't fight, and they are essentially forced to sign this at their side. Uh, this image so, shows some of the kind of junior staff that was uh, attached to the diplomats over here peeking into the Hall of Mirrors to watch the historic event of the signing of the treaty. Now, when the Versailles Treaty is signed, there were some who noted that in making a treaty to end the war, to end all wars, what they actually did in Paris was create a peace to end all peace. Because they realized the inherent flaws in the treaty. Those flaws basically centered around the idea that Germany was at fault. That the entire thing, the entire conflict, the four years of bloodshed and destruction were caused by Germany. Um, so here are a couple of images with that idea in the aftermath of the treaty. Here you see the Allies giving the ultimatum to Germany, sign the treaty or else. And uh, Germany over here basically unable to resist. They're being for forced on this uh, treaty at the point of a bayonet. Now what does the Versailles Treaty actually say that becomes so dangerous, becomes so uh, antagonistic toward Germany? 
Well, first off, Germany had to pay for the war. They had billions of dollars of war reparations imposed on them. Uh, somewhere between 30 and 55 billion dollars that Germany had to pay for destruction that was caused during the war. Uh, that was 30 to 55 billion dollars in 1918 dollars, which is a tremendous amount of money. Today it's kind of like pocket change. Then it was a lot of money. Uh, as another part of the Versailles Treaty, the German military had to be reduced in size. Germany was not allowed to have tanks, so their tanks were destroyed. They were not allowed to have military airplanes, so their airplanes were destroyed. The German fleet was supposed to be interned uh, basically in, in uh, Scotland. Germany wasn't going to have access to its fleet. Now many of the uh, German captains and admirals uh, blew up their ships rather than letting them fall into the hands of the British. They scuttled their ships. But still, the German military was greatly reduced. The size of the German military was capped. Germany was not allowed to have a large military anymore. The Allies thought German aggression, German militarism was the cause of the war, so how do you root that out? But by preventing Germany from having a military. In addition to that, the map of Europe is redrawn as a result of the Versailles Treaty. In 1900, Europe was dominated by powerful empires. You had the German Empire here in the center, the Austro-Hungarian Empire here, the Russian Empire in the east, and the Ottoman Empire down here in Italy and France. Um, as a result of the First World War, and as a result of the treaties that ended the First World War, the map of Europe in 1919 looked completely different. Uh, France over here gained some territory. Italy gained some territory. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is fragmented. It is broken up. You have Austria and Hungary. Uh, and Czechoslovakia is created out of that. And all of the independent kingdoms down here in the Balkans. You basically have the creation of modern Yugoslavia as a result of the deterioration of the Austrian Empire. Uh, Germany itself loses territory. Uh, Poland, which had ceased to exist in the late 18th century, is redrawn on the map of Europe with territory taken from Germany and Russia. So the map of Europe after World War I looks very different than it did before World War I. And Germany itself was forced to uh, surrender territory as a result of the war. Um, a lot of German territory was stripped away, part of it for the creation of Poland, some of it for the creation of Czechoslovakia over here. Other parts of German territory were occupied by the Allies, particularly the French. The French occupied uh, the Rhineland, which is this area, and the, uh, the Saar over here. Excuse me, the French occupied the Ruhr and the Saar. Uh, those were the industrial areas of Germany. The French also take back the territories they had lost to Germany during the Franco-Prussian War in the, seven, in the 1870s. So they take back Alsace and Lorraine. And the area of the Rhineland, the part of Germany that, flows, that is located along the Rhine River, was demilitarized. Germany was not allowed to station troops there. France had created a buffer zone between Germany and France itself. So Germany loses tremendous amounts of territory as a result of the First World War and the Versailles Treaty. Despite this, perhaps the most damning part of the Versailles Treaty was the fact that Germany was forced to accept the blame for all of the destruction. Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty, which is sometimes called the War Guilt Clause, places the blame for all of the destruction, all of the loss of life, all of the, the terror of the First World War squarely on Germany. Uh, you can see, it says, the Allied and Associated Governments affirm, and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. Germany is to blame. The destruction of European society was Germany's fault. Uh, the German cartoon over there on the right kind of highlights the German reaction to this war guilt clause. You have Wilson and Clemenceau and David Lloyd George leading a bound uh, shirtless Germany to the guillotine. Germany is to blame. Germany has to accept the, the 
cause of the destruction of that was wrought during the First World War. So most of the Versailles Treaty puts the blame on Germany and tries to limit German military power, ger, uh, limit German aggression in the future. There was one important part of the Versailles Treaty, however, that was uh, the brainchild of Woodrow Wilson. The one idealistic thing that he managed to hold on to at the Paris Peace Conference, and that was the creation of an international body where nations could take their disagreements, could take their disputes to be peacefully resolved. Wilson had envisioned the creation of a League of Nations, a league where, as I mentioned, uh, diplomacy and negotiation would take the place of aggression and warfare. The League of Nations becomes part of the Versailles Treaty, and when the treaty is signed, the League of Nations uh, goes into existence. Now, Wilson was one of the architects of the peace. He negotiates this treaty, and he thinks that this is a great accomplishment. We have ended the war, Germany will be uh, submissive, and we have this League of Nations that will prevent uh, future warfare. When Wilson comes back to the United States with the Versailles Treaty in hand, well, it's about that thick, so he probably had two hands, uh, and presents it to the Senate for ratification, what happens? They don't ratify it. The Senate rejects it. The Senate does not like the Versailles Treaty. Why? What's the problem that the Senate has with the Versailles Treaty? Uh, before we get into that, who really leads the, uh, the charge at preventing the ratification of the Versailles Treaty? Uh, it's this guy over here with the, the beard and mustache. He's a senator from Massachusetts. Nobody knows. <laughs> um, Henry Cabot Lodge. Oh, glory be. A name that we all know in Massachusetts, but nobody uh, really knows what he looks like. Henry Cabot Lodge was in the Senate for a very long time. One of the, the power brokers of, of the Senate at the turn of the 20th century. He was um, idealistically opposed to Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was a Democrat, um, Lodge a Republican. They didn't want to work together. Wilson comes back with this, what he thinks is a tremendous accomplishment of the Versailles Peace Treaty. The Senate rejects it. Now, the fact that the Senate rejected the treaty was shocking to many people, particularly in England and in Europe. Uh, and you see this cartoon over here that uh, basically condemns the United States yeah. Senate. The cartoon is called The Accuser. And what you see is the U.S. Senate, dressed in a Roman toga, who has just murdered the Treaty of Peace. And humanity over here is pointing accusingly at the Senate. Your failure to ratify this causes the treaty to fail. Now, why did the Senate refuse to ratify the Versailles Treaty? What was it about that treaty that the Senate didn't like, other than, you know, Woodrow Wilson was involved in making it? League of Nations. It was the League of Nations. This thing, this international body, the brainchild of the President of the United States. What did the Senate have against that? What did Lodge have against the League of Nations? Well, traditionally in American history, there was this sense that the United States was distinct from Europe and that we should not have, in George Washington's phrase, entangling alliances with other parts of the world. We were separate, we were different, we were unique, and we didn't want to be tied to the affairs going on in Europe. The Senate, many who were opposed to the treaty in the Senate, saw the League of Nations as an entangling alliance. The United States would get sucked into this international body, we would have to uh, perhaps go to war, we would perhaps have to expend our wealth in maintaining this international body, and um, there was outcry against it. So Wilson comes back to the United States, presents the treaty. The treaty is rejected by the Senate, and Wilson says, well, I'm going to go to the people. And he begins a uh, public campaign to put pressure on the Senate. He goes around the country, traveling by train, talking to the people, encouraging them to tell their senators to ratify the treaty. While Wilson is off on this round-the-country trip, he suffers a massive stroke uh, and is rushed back to Washington, D.C., essentially largely incapacitated. Uh, during the period of his um, recovery from the stroke, his wife, Edith Wilson, 
uh, undertakes kind of unofficially the duties of the president. She begins to decide who the president can talk to, who, he, who can come and see the president. Uh, it's rumored that she actually signed some pieces of legislation into law, forging her husband's signature, that sort of thing. So Wilson wants the League of Nations. The Senate rejects it. The United States never ratifies the Versailles Treaty. So technically, the United States in 1919, 1920 is still at war with Germany. Uh, it isn't until about 1923 or so that the Congress passes a resolution declaring that we're no longer at war with Germany. Um, in any case, the League of Nations was the thing that drove the Senate to reject the Versailles Treaty. Yet, despite the fact that the United States wasn't there, the League of Nations does go into operation. What you see here is the first meeting of the League in 1920. Uh, the League of Nations would exist for 26 years, 25, 26 years, and would try to maintain the peace, would try to prevent the outbreak of far-reaching um, military conflict. The problem with the League is that it was a very weak organization. It didn't have a lot that it could do if a member country violated its dictates. Plus, the fact that the United States never joined it made the entire thing structurally weak. At this point, the United States was the uh, largest economy in the world, the leading industrial and banking power in the world. Uh, by 1918, we had a large military and a large navy. We were an important cog in the functioning of the League of Nations, but we never joined the international organization. Here's a map of the countries that do join. Uh, and you can see that many countries come in and leave the League of Nations at various times, but the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Mongolia never join the League of Nations. Um, I guess a modern day parallel, parallel of this could be like the Paris Climate Accords mm -hmm. that we were in, now we're not in, and who knows if we're going to be back in. In any case, um, so the League of Nations was fundamentally flawed because the United States was never a part of it. This cartoon here illustrates the bridge of the League of Nations, designed by the President of the United States, but the keystone to that bridge, the central part, the United States isn't part of it. In fact, Uncle Sam seems to be taking a, a nap over there, uh, enjoying a stogie while leaning on that keystone. So the League of Nations was a good idea. It was an institution that was meant to prevent another calamity like the First World War. And it was really indicative of um, a growing international peace movement in the late 19-teens going into the 1920s. The war itself was so shocking, was so destructive, that we begin to see a desire for peace breaking out around the world, in Europe, in the United States. There are advocates who push for the establishment of uh, a destruction of the military, essentially, a limiting of the capacities of the military. And there are several events that occur in the 1920s that support this idea of an international peace movement uh, diplomatically. One of the first of these international movements were, was a series of naval conferences. Um, the first one held in Washington, D.C. in 1920 going into 1920, excuse me, 21 going into 22. The goal of these naval conferences, uh, ones in Washington, there were a couple held in Geneva and a couple held in London, was to limit the size of navies around the world. One of the causes of the First World War was a naval arms race between Britain and Germany. They each wanted to build bigger, faster, more powerful ships, and once you had all these ships, well, you might as well use them, right? That was one of the things that led to war. So the naval conferences, the naval disarmament conferences that emerged in the wake of the First World War were meant to limit the size of navies. Um, here at Washington, five powers participated, really, in limiting the size of their navies. The United States and Great Britain were allowed to have the largest navies in the world by the negotiations. Why? Because they had global empires, uh, so they needed their navies. Then uh, France and Italy were allowed to have navies of certain sizes, and Japan was allowed to have a navy of a certain size. As part of the naval conference in Washington, the allies, the negotiating powers, also agreed to respect the sovereignty of China. China hadn't really participated in the First World War, had gone through an internal revolution by the 1920s. You have the emergence of a Chinese Republic uh, 
Uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was the president. He's later uh, succeeded by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, so you have nationalist China. And the powers wanted to kind of maintain the territorial integrity of China, so they all agreed to not get involved in China. It was basically the gist of one of those. And there were several other treaties that come out of this, but the idea was to prevent na a naval arms race, pre prevent the uh, accidental starting of an international war by getting involved in China. That was one of the steps in trying to ensure peace during this period. At the same time, that this is going on, there are tremendous economic difficulties in Germany. The German economy is shattered in the wake of the First World War. German towns have been destroyed. The German in industrial sector is controlled by the French at this point. Uh, yet Germany has to pay back billions and billions of dollars of reparations. Uh, there are stories from about 1920, 1921, 1922 that the German Deutschmark, the German currency, was practically worthless that a loaf of bread costs something like 40 million marks. Uh, there are images of housewives lighting their kitchen fires with bundles of German currency, or people wallpapering their walls with German currency because the, the paper money wasn't worth anything. The economy in Germany, frankly, sucked. It was terrible. It had collapsed because of the war and because of the reparations. Now, the fact that the German economy had collapsed was not good for Britain and France because Britain and France were relying on these reparations from Germany to kind of boost their economies, to kind of pay down their war debt. So if Germany's defaulting on its payments, then things aren't good for Britain and France. And if things aren't good for Britain and France, then that could have a ripple effect across the Atlantic Ocean here in the United States, because who had bankrolled much of the war? Who had given loans to Britain and France while they were fighting? but the United States. So the failures of the German economy were having a global impact in the early 1920s. Well, what are we going to do about that? An American congressman named Dawes, who I believe was from Ohio, in 1924 comes up with a plan to stabilize the German economy. The Dawes plan called for a heavy American cash flow to Germany we would be sending money to Germany, which the Germans would use to fuel their economy, then using that economic growth, make their payments to Britain and France, who in turn, having this new inflow of money, would be able to pay back the debt they owed to the United States. So what we end up with is creating a giant triangle of cash flow emanating from the United States, billions of dollars of loans to Germany, Germany paying off reparations to the Allies, the Allies paying off their loans to the United States. Uh, in the end, the United States is profiting from this arrangement. The Dawes plan was so successful that within five years, the German economy was on stable footing. Things looked to be going well. That when the Dawes plan expired in 1929, it was replaced by a similar plan, the Young plan. Uh, same idea, sending money to Germany, Germany paying their war debt, money coming back to the United States in this big, this big circle. Uh, the cartoon over here actually illustrates the young plan emerging as a phoenix out of the ruins of the, or the end of the Dawes plan. Um, the young plan probably could have been successful too, except uh, what happens in 1929 to the global economy? Crash. The Great Depression. I was born. It must have been your fault. Uh, the Great Depression breaks out in late 1929, causing a global economic collapse. The Young Plan never gets the chance to actually be implemented because the money isn't there anymore. But you do have this plan to bring economic stability to Germany in the interwar year as part of the process of trying to stabilize Germany, trying to, to bring peace to Europe and the world. Symptomatic of this, plan of this effort to maintain peace in Europe. In 1925, representatives from Germany, Britain, and France meet at Locarno, a lovely mountain town in Switzerland. Uh, lots of mountains, pretty lakes, probably some cows munching grass in the field, that sort of thing, to kind of hammer out some of the details that were left undecided by the Versailles Treaty. One of the things that the Versailles Treaty hadn't really addressed were some of the border dispute issues. Where should the border lines go between or among these countries? What territory should be where? 
and you know, is this Germany or is this Italy or is this France? Those types of questions. So the diplomats from these three nations meet at Locarno and through peaceful negotiation and a sense of fraternity, they are able to solve the disputes that were unresolved. This sense of cooperation that we see here at Locarno comes to be called the spirit of Locarno. It is this idea that cooperation could perhaps solve the problems we have. We don't have to go to war. We can rely on diplomacy to settle the questions that divide us. Uh, it was a hopeful moment, this idea that maybe we would learned a lesson between 1914 and 1918. Maybe we could move beyond our nationalistic tendencies and our imperialistic tendencies and actually peacefully solve some of our dilemmas. Um, so a very important, though forgotten, moment in this post-war uh, peace movement. And that brings us to perhaps one of my uh, favorite pieces of international <laughs> diplomacy, <laughs> the, the Kellogg-Briand Pact. The Kellogg-Briand Pact was a, um, a document, a, an agreement that was crafted by the American Secretary of State William Kellogg and the French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand. Uh, Briand was the guy with the mustache in the previous photograph. Um, and the idea of the Kellogg-Briand Pact was that the nations that sign on to the treaty would essentially agree never to wage war again. Uh, you can see the introductory paragraph here of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. The high contracting parties solemnly declare in the names of their respective peoples that they condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy in the relations with one another. <coughs> we will not go to war with the other countries that sign this treaty. The United States, France, Britain, Italy, <coughs> Germany, Japan eventually all signed this. I think about 26 or 28 countries eventually signed, signed the uh, Kellogg-Briand Pact. The, picture over there shows President Calvin Coolidge signing the pact into, uh, into effect. Um, the Kellogg Ground Pact, as I mentioned, is one of my favorite pieces of diplomacy because it was so idealistic. It says, we are going to give up on war. We promise not to wage war. I'm not going to wage war against you, Germany. I'm not going to wage war against you, Japan. But what was the practicality of it? Could that treaty actually be enforced? What if Japan decides to violate the terms of the pact? What happens then? What if Germany or Italy decide to violate the terms of the pact? What happens? There was really no way of enforcing this promise. It would relied on the goodwill of the countries, the governments. It relied on the belief that we all wanted peace. Um, so beautifully idealistic, but fatally flawed in its uh, implementation. Kind of ironically, at the same moment that Calvin Coolidge was signing this uh, pact and signing the United States agreement to it, um, Congress was debating a naval armaments bill. They were requisitioning more money to build bigger, faster battleships. So on the one hand, we're saying we want peace, and on the other hand, we're saying, but just in case that doesn't work, we might as well have some big, powerful ships. Now, though there was, in general, this international movement toward peace, and stability and away from warfare. We've learned the lessons from the First World War. Somewhat ironically, the 1920s and early 1930s was also an age of the rise of dictators. Uh, we begin to see dictators emerging in Europe who would eventually lead Europe and the rest of the world into uh, further bloodshed and further war. In 1922, Benito Mussolini over here gains control of Italy. He and his fascist followers um, gain enough seats in the Italian parliament that they force the Italian government to essentially grant Mussolini dictatorial powers. He will remain in power in Italy until the uh, mid-1940s. I think he's finally killed in 1945. Uh, in Russia, Russia, which had pulled out of the First World War in 1917, gone through an internal revolution. You have the establishment of the Soviet Union in the 1920s. Um, Joseph Stalin emerges as the dictator and ruler of Russia in about 1924, 1925, after the death of Vladimir Lenin. He would be perhaps the most bloodthirsty, one of the most bloodthirsty and destructive dictators of the 20th century. Uh, Stalin 
basically kills some 12 to 20 million of his own people during his reign from the 1920s to the 1950s. And then in the early 1930s, in Germany, Adolf Hitler rises to power. Now, Hitler's rise to power is based on a couple of things. One, the fact that Germany was resentful of the Versailles Treaty. The fact that many aspects, many people in the German population felt that the Versailles Treaty was unfair, that it unfairly punished Germany. Uh, he also emerges out of the economic chaos of the Great Depression. The Weimar Republic that had replaced the German Empire is unable to maintain economic stability. And in elections um, in the early 1930s, the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, gains seats in the Reichstag. And eventually, they gain so many seats that Hitler is appointed the Chancellor of Germany. The president is Paul von Hindenburg. When Hindenburg dies in 1933, Hitler grabs the reins of power and will maintain those reins of power until uh, the end of the Second World War in 1945. <clears throat> so while there is diplomacy afoot, while there is this effort to maintain peace, we do see the rise of these dictatorships in Europe. In Japan, you see the rise of a uh, military nationalism. Uh, the military begins to gain control of Germany, the admiral, excuse me, of Japan. The admirals and the generals become the, the sources of authority and power within the Japanese empire. Now, as I mentioned, Japan had been an ally during the First World War, they had fought against Germany and the Ottoman Empire and those, those uh, entities. When the war ended and the Japanese show up at Versailles, they come with a list of demands. But they were largely ignored. They were kind of cast aside. You know, Wilson and uh, Clemenceau and Lloyd George didn't take the Japanese seriously. After all, they're, they're only Japanese. They're Asian. We don't need to listen to them. This is, you know, a European concern. So the Japanese grow very uh, untrust, uh, they, they stop trusting the West. They grow resentful and suspicious of the West. And they decide, you know what, we're going to go our own way. We're going to build our own empire. And what we see happening is that the Japanese begin to conquer and establish a Japanese empire in the Pacific. Now, in doing so, in this process of Japanese expansion in the early 1930s, um, Japan begins to violate many of the treaties that she had been a uh, part of. Uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, the Washington Naval Conference, um, all of those things kind of stand in the way of Japanese expansion. So the Japanese begin to ignore them. They begin to violate them. These two cartoons kind of show that. Here you have Japan blowing through the Nine Power Treaty on uh, China, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, the League of Nations Covenant, government promises, all these various treaties. Here you see the Kellogg-Briand Pact in flames being burned by an aggressive Japan. Japan didn't trust the West. Japan didn't feel it needed the West. It was going to go its own way. It was going to create its own empire. It was looking out for the interests of Japan. And it had to violate many of these, um, these treaties. Now, what is the League of Nations doing while Japan begins to expand, begins to kind of wage war in East Asia? League of Nations basically says, Japan, stop doing that. You can't do that. We're going to uh, not sell you oil or iron. And what do the Japanese do? The Japanese delegation at the League of Nations basically <laughs> close their folders, stand up, and leave. Japan withdraws from the League of Nations, uh, showing the great weakness of that institution. In any case, in 1931, Japan goes to war with China in what is called the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, the first one was in the late 19th century. The Japanese basically stage an incident in northern China along a railroad. Um, they have an attack on a Japanese train. Uh, the attack was so minor that trains are rolling over the tracks again an hour or so afterwards. But it was a provocation that the Japanese had staged so they had an excuse to invade northern China, Manchuria which they do. That leads to the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, this war would be incredibly brutal. It would lead to tremendous loss of life and incidents of horrific violence. Um, this image over here kind of illustrates that. In many of the Chinese towns, Japanese soldiers went in and killed everybody and often dumped the bodies into nearby rivers. And here you see a Japanese soldier standing on a riverbank 
that has receded and there are just piles of corpses right there. Uh, victims of that. Here you have Japanese troops marching into parts of northern China. Uh, victims of a stampede that was caused by the fear of a Japanese air raid in other Chinese cities. Um, the, Chinese the Japanese invasion of China was a brutal, brutal event. Now at that time, in the early 1930s, China itself was undergoing a civil war. You had the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong. They were fighting for control of China. But when the Japanese invaded, the two sides in the Chinese struggle put aside their differences to fight against the common enemy. It wouldn't be until after the Second World War that the, uh, the civil war in China essentially reemerges. Now, Japan had signed all of these agreements, but their actions were violating those agreements. And eventually, the Japanese do formally pull out of many of the treaties they had signed. Here you see the uh, Boston American saying that Japan scraps the naval pact in 1935. The Literary Digest, Japan denounces treaty. Uh, the Japanese were no longer interested in what the West was saying and what the other countries were saying. They were going their own way in creating a <laughs> Japanese empire. Now, the Japanese barely felt any punishment for their actions. The League of Nations tried to punish them, the Japanese leave. So that kind of emboldened other nations to undertake uh, dramatic military action. And what we see is that in 1935, Italy begins a process of territorial expansion. Now when Mussolini comes to power in Italy in the 1920s, he has a vision of creating a second Roman Empire. He wants Italy to emerge, to develop into one of the great industrial uh, and military powers in Europe. And uh, he undertakes a couple of wars of conquest. Now, Italy already had possessions in Africa at this time. They controlled Libya, and they controlled uh, what is basically today Somalia and Eritrea. Um, and they wanted to increase their holdings in East Africa. So in 1935, the Italians invade the independent kingdom of Abyssinia, or Ethiopia. Now, the Italians had tried to conquer Ethiopia before, in the 1890s, and they had been uh, repelled by the Ethiopians. Here in 1935, Italy shows up on the borders of Ethiopia with airplanes and modern equipment and poison gases. And they attack the Ethiopian tribesmen who are on horseback and on foot fighting with uh, single fire rifles. And the Italians are using airplanes and, and lethal gas and machine guns. Uh, the fight in Ethiopia was very one-sided. The Ethiopians fight bravely. They fight gallantly, but they are outmatched and outclassed uh, by the material superiority of the Italians. Uh, here are some images of that time period. This is a picture of, uh, it's an Ethiopian image showing the Ethiopians fighting against the Italians over here in St. Michael, kind of blessing the entire scene. Here you have uh, Italian colonial troops in Ethiopia who were part of the, the struggle. And there's an Italian propaganda picture showing the current 1930s Italian soldier picking up the gun of the fallen uh, Italian soldier from the 1890s and going on to avenge the, that Italian defeat and finally conquer Ethiopia. When the Italians do invade, the emperor of Ethiopia, a guy named Haile Selassie, goes into exile. He flees Ethiopia, goes first to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, and then makes his way to uh, Geneva, the headquarters of the League of Nations. And he shows up in front of the League of Nations and uh, pleads with the League to help his country. We have been invaded. We have been, our sovereignty has been violated. Uh, he gives this impassioned plea. While uh, Haile Selassie is addressing the League of Nations, Italian journalists in the gallery are hissing and booing and throwing things. When Haile Selassie is finished, everybody at the League of Nations is moved. They all applaud nicely and then do nothing. Italy is, gets a slap on the wrist. Ethiopia becomes an Italian colony. Um, so the Italians begin to undertake this aggression in Africa. In Europe, Hitler, who is uh, solidifying his power in Germany, um, decides to test the resolve of the Allies. He begins to purposely attempt to provoke the Allies to see how they will react to these provocations. Now, one of the things that Hitler does when he comes into power is he begins to secretly rebuild German military strength. 
The Germans weren't supposed to have tanks or airplanes. They were limited in the number of troops they could have, but he manages to kind of secretly build up this strength. He does some of that by reaching a, uh, an agreement with Joseph Stalin in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and uh, sends German troops to train in Russia, has Russian factories building German tanks, that sort of thing, behind, uh, away from the eyes of the Western Allies. In any case, Hitler decides to test the Allies. And one of the first things he does in 1936 is he sends German troops into the Rhineland, that western border area of Germany, from which uh, the Versailles Treaty had banned German troops. The French and the British do nothing. So Hitler says, ah, they're not going to do anything. So I'm going to try something else. In March of 1938, the Sudetenland. not the Sudetenland yet, <laughs> he goes into Austria. Germany annexes Austria. Now, Hitler was actually Austrian. He was born in Austria. So he is essentially uh, bringing his homeland back into uni unity with Germany. Uh, he creates the German Reich, uniting Germany and Austria. Uh, this is called the Anschluss. Then, the Allies do nothing. They don't do anything. So, Hitler decides, you know what? I am going to try one more thing. That area of the Sudetenland, and this slide's kind of out of order, but that area of the Sudetenland in what is now <coughs> Czechoslovakia, that has a lot of ethnic Germans in it. And I want to bring those ethnic Germans into my greater German Reich. Now, Czechoslovakia, the independence of Czechoslovakia was guaranteed by the Versailles Treaty. And Hitler knew he couldn't just march into the Sudetenland because that would violate the terms of the treaty and would kind of um, force Britain and France to take military action. So Hitler makes known what he wants to do. And he says, if you allies agree to give me this, pop, this part of Czechoslovakia that is occupied, that has Germans living in it, I promise I won't try to gather, take any more land in Germany. So the British and the French, particularly the British, say, you know what, we can negotiate. So in um, 1938, a conference is held in Munich, Germany. And at this Munich conference, a pact is signed, the Munich Pact. By the terms of the Munich Pact, uh, Hitler is given permission to occupy the Sudetenland, this kind of darker yellow and he promises not to wage war or acquire any more territory in Europe. Uh, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, this guy over here, uh, thinks that this is a stroke of diplomatic genius. In fact, he flies back to London and steps off of his airplane, holding the Munich Pact in his hand, and he says, Peace in our time. I believe we have peace in our time. Um, he trusted Hitler, Hitler's promise not to be uh, expansively aggressive anymore. Now, historians sometimes look at the Munich Pact as appeasement, giving Hitler what he wants in return for empty promises. Because what actually happens? Does Hitler stop with the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia? No. We'll get to that in a minute, though. Uh, so the Sudetenland is occupied by the Germans. Uh, how do the Czechs feel about that? Were they even asked? Not no. really. Um, in any case, while this is going on over here, you have Italy waging war in Africa, you have Germany expanding in Central Europe and Japan invading China. There is another uh, tragic struggle that breaks out in Europe itself, in Spain. In 1936, civil war breaks out in Spain. The civil war in Spain pitted um, fa the fascists led by Francisco Franco over here versus communist republicans who uh, were trying to maintain a republican form of government versus a dictatorship in Spain. The Spanish Civil War would be tremendously tragic. It would be tremendously complex. Uh, part of the, the tragedy of it is that you had Spaniards killing Spaniards, fighting in Spanish towns, in Spanish villages, for ideologies that were essentially foreign to Spain. To make matters more complex in the Spanish Civil War, um, outside interests started getting involved. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini begin sending uh, troops and equipment to support Franco. Stalin begins sending troops and equipment to support the, uh, the Republicans. 
and you have this tremendous amount of bloodshed and horrific acts of violence. Uh, the murdering and raping of nuns, the burning of monasteries, the wholesale bombing of civilian populations. Uh, very, very destructive, very, very tragic. Uh, here's Franco, there's one of the Republican fighters. Uh, in a way, the Spanish Civil War was a precursor and a microcosm of the ideologies that were dividing Europe at that time. Uh, it produced some of the most dramatic images of warfare. The famous image of the, uh, loyal, the ro loyalist soldier being killed at the moment of his uh, death. Uh, Pablo Picasso paints perhaps his most famous painting, Guernica. Uh, Ernest Hemingway writes one of his finest novels about the Spanish Civil War, for whom the bell tolls. Um, it was a war of tragedy and destruction that eventually comes to an end in 1938 with the victory of Francisco Franco. Franco would remain the dictator of Spain until the 1970s. With his death in the 1970s, the uh, Spanish monarchy is reestablished, and the current king and queen of Spain are uh, in power as a result of this, this long process in Spain. Now, uh, Spain, as I said, was a microcosm and a, a preview of the divide in Europe. Those dividing lines became more concrete and more uh, firm in 1939 when fascist Italy under Mussolini and Nazi Germany under Hitler form an alliance. In August of 1939, they sign what is the uh, so-called Pact of Steel. Uh, famously, Mussolini says, now no power will be able to separate us. Germany and Italy become allies. Um, this was important for Germany because Hitler didn't know what to make of Mussolini. He didn't know uh, if he could trust Mussolini prior to the signing of this treaty. After all, Mussolini had invested tremendous amounts of money building a, uh, a large Italian navy in a uh, very flamboyant Italian air force. Italy was right on the southern border of Germany. So Hitler couldn't really take any concrete action if Italy was not his ally. So the Pact of Steel is signed in August of 1939, and that allowed Hitler to look at one other aspect of the Versailles Treaty that he and the Germans found offensive. That was the existence of the Polish Corridor. When Poland was recreated on the map of Europe, a corridor to the Baltic Sea was created. Poland extended to the Baltic Sea. But in creating that corridor, it separated East Prussia over here from the rest of Germany. So you had Germany, Poland, and then Germany again. This was seen as territory that should be traditionally German. Uh, the city, the Baltic city of Danzig, which is the German name for it, it's Gdansk in Poland, um, was a free city. But it was also a, set, a, a location where the Nazis could um, fabricate an incident. And it was there in Danzig that uh, Nazi operators do in late August create an incident that Hitler uses as an excuse for the invasion of Poland in September of 1939. The invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939 is what starts the Second World War. So what do we see? We see the tremendous cataclysm of the First World War. Millions and millions of lives lost. Much of Europe decimated and destroyed because of the conflict. And an international peace movement that emerges out of that in the 1920s. That peace movement, idealistic but flawed. Uh, the political situation in Europe gives rise to dictatorships in Italy, Russia, uh, Italy, Russia, and Germany. And those dictators pushing their nationalistic agendas and their desire to kind of outdo one another eventually lead to increased conflict, which will eventually sparks the Second World War. In many ways, the Second World War, big bug right there, the Second World War emerges directly out of the failings of the Versailles Treaty. Had the Versailles Treaty been an equitable treaty, had it taken into account some of the German concerns, would somebody like Adolf Hitler have come to power? Would we have ended up <coughs> fighting a Second World War 20 years later? It's one of those big historical what-ifs. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs>
question. Yes. Why did Hitler choose Poland? Why did Hitler choose Poland? Well, um, <coughs> by 1939, Hitler had developed, Hitler and the Nazis had developed this idea of the Germans being the ideal race, the chosen people. They had seen, he viewed the Slavic peoples, peoples of Eastern Europe, as inferior. Poland, a Slavic country, um, occupied with people that Ger the Germans felt were inferior, was kind of an easy target. Hitler knew that a uh, growing German population and growing German military might meant that they needed more land, more territory, and perhaps Poland was the venue where that territory could be found. Uh, now, before invading Poland, Hitler actually does sign a secret non-aggression pact with Stalin. He basically tells Stalin, hey, I'm going to invade Poland, and I'm going to go this far in Poland, and then once I'm there, I'll invite you in to take over the rest of Poland. So by the end of September 1939, Poland ceases to exist again as an independent entity, swallowed up by Germany on one part and um, Russia on the other, or the Soviet Union on the other. Any other questions? Yes? What do you know about like Ho Chi Minh coming up to Woodrow Wilson? Coming up to Woodrow Wilson, and okay. asking for like Vietnamese independence. Ho Chi Minh uh, was a Vietnamese freedom fighter. Uh, Vietnam at that time was referred to as French Indochina because it was a French colony. And the Vietnamese had been struggling to gain independence. The French didn't want to let go of their colony, so there's kind of this revolution brewing in Vietnam. Now, during uh, the First World War, there are efforts by the v certain Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh, to gain diplomatic recognition for an independent Vietnam. The problem is, France didn't want Vietnam to be independent. France was one of the people sitting at the table there. So Ho Chi Minh may have wanted an independent Vietnam, but he wasn't going to get it through diplomacy at Versailles. Now, interestingly, uh, supposedly after that, after the First World War, after the Versailles Treaty, Ho Chi Minh does make his way to the United States, and he works for a short time in Boston at the Parker House Hotel as a, uh, a, 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 a bellboy and a... Um, uh, part of the wait staff. Uh, and then he goes on to France and to London before going back to Vietnam to really become the father of the uh, Vietnamese independent movement in the mid 20th century. So there are Boston ties to uh, Vietnam and French Indochina. Uh, if you've ever driven on the, uh, the the expressway going in or out of Boston and there's the big gas tank over there, mm -hmm. the artist put a uh, in one of those those yes. I believe it's the blue color yeah. a profile of Ho Chi Minh right. so, uh, that you you, oh, yeah. you, yeah. you can yeah. see it if you're not the one driving <laughs> you can take a look at the uh, the tank well you know if you're going at rush hour you're <laughs> sitting there anyway but um, so there are ties between Boston and World War one and French Indochina and Ho Chi Minh all right well thanks a lot Thank you.